me resume recording. So we didn't miss too much there. Okay, good. Uh, so if you, for those who want to come back and view this recording, we've just reiterated that the latitudinal diversity gradient, thank you, Ben, um, is the key ecological pattern. And that because of population growth and the expansion of uh, agriculture at a variety of scales means that we are impacting species uh, enormously, right? Okay, so that's just some general comments at the outset. So if we think about how do we move forward, right? What do we need to be doing uh, as a species ourselves, as a society uh, to protect nature in the long run? Uh, here is one approach uh, that has been suggested and that is to spend our conservation dollars in areas where it matters, okay? And these areas are called global hotspots. So this is a really interesting uh, notion. It was um, a concept that was put forward um, incidentally by one of my professors in England. Uh, his name was Norman Myers, very, very smart guy. And uh, he came up with this idea that there is simply too much pressure on our land surface and there's not enough money to go around to save every species on the planet. So we should be looking at regions on the planet that are those regions of the greatest concern, right? Uh, not just the greatest biodiversity, but the greatest concern. So he called these regions global hotspots. And uh, Norman Meyer said that to qualify as a hotspot, a region on the globe must check both these boxes, right? So a hotspot must have at least 1,500 plant species that are endemic to that region. Endemic means they only grow there, i.e. they are irreplaceable, okay? But it must also satisfy the second criteria. And the second criteria is that it must have lost more than 70% of its uh, original uh, vegetation, right? In other words, it must have less than 30% of its original natural vegetation in place. 70% must have been cleared, right? In other words, it's an area that is not only rich in species diversity with irreplaceable species, but it's also an area that is threatened uh, by the loss of habitat, right? If that makes sense to everybody. So this is the map um, that I just want to spend a minute or two talking about. This is the current map of global hotspots uh, around the world, right? Uh, I'm not going to ask you in the exam, everybody, to, to remember exactly what area is a hotspot and what isn't a hotspot. But I do want you to understand why an area would be a hotspot or would not be a hotspot, right? So for example, let's take a look at this area here in South America that we've talked about, right? So this is the Amazon, okay? The Amazon basin. So the Amazon rainforest is an area that is very rich in biodiversity. It easily has more than 1,500 species that are endemic to that region. The reason why the central Amazon is not a hotspot is that it still contains a lot of its intact forest, right? It's lost about 20% of its rainforest, if you remember from our deforestation lecture, or about 80% of the forest remains intact, right? So that's why it's not a hotspot, because it doesn't qualify on that second criteria, if there's any questions on that. Make sense? Okay, cool. So just as an example, right? Um, when we look at Minnesota, so Minnesota is a beautiful and wonderful state, Okay, it's got about 1,700 plant species. Only one of those is endemic to Minnesota, right? Ecuador, on the other hand, about the same size as Minnesota, has about 20,000 plant species, and 4,000 of them are endemic only to Ecuador. Everybody see the difference, right? So this notion of irreplaceability uh, is absolutely key in identifying uh, the hotspots, right? A uh, couple of other things to point out here. Note, notice just how important Indonesia is, Malaysia, right? The great rainforests of South Asia and Southeast Asia, okay? Uh, Madagascar, we've talked about, right? Madagascar and the Indian Ocean Islands. So Madagascar um, is an extraordinarily rich uh, place. It contains about 10% of all the world's known species and almost all of its forest is gone, right? So less than 10% of its forest remains intact. 
So the idea here, everybody, is that we should be focused initially. If we're going to start thinking about and engage in a discussion about what species we should be saving, according to Professor Myers, we should be focused on these areas um, and to try and save as much of these areas as we possibly can. All right, let me see if there are any questions there, any comments or thoughts. I need you to understand what a hotspot is and what are the qualifiers. All good. All right. Okay, so let's move on. So we've talked about, uh, when we first got together, I talked about how do you put a price on an ecosystem, right? So let's talk about, can we save the world species? Or maybe we should phrase that, can we afford to save the world species, right? So here's a, here's a really cool species, the giant panda. Some of you may have seen pandas. I saw some in the National Zoo in Washington, and I saw three panda cubs at the National Zoo in Singapore. Amazing creature, right? I mean, who doesn't love pandas? But would it matter if pandas went extinct? Well, they're, uh, they're pretty aggressive, aren't they? Like, they definitely impact a lot of other species. They do impact species. Mm -hmm. Obviously not trying to, you know, say that their lives don't matter in any way, but like it, from from the very little knowledge that I know on pandas, I, I feel like I've definitely heard a lot of things in, uh, in regards to how they impact um, the species around them due to their, you know, like highly aggressive nature and stuff. Yeah, and don't, uh, Nolan, that's a, an interesting comment, and don't um, downplay your lack of knowledge or, or you know, it, it's, it's, I know you're not trying to be controversial in saying that, that's, you know, that's, that's a reality. I want to begin to peel back the layers of what is a really complicated issue, right? Saving the world species, because I can tell you that pandas are extremely expensive, not just in monetary terms to, to get them into a zoo, but in terms of upkeep, because they only eat one thing, right? They eat eucalyptus leaves. Right? So pandas are extraordinarily expensive to keep under uh, in captivity, right? But would it matter, would the world collapse if we let pandas go? No, because they're not a keystone species. Yep, correct, but they're not a keystone species. So what's a keystone species? That's a species that is a fundamental species to the functioning of an ecosystem, right? If we let bees go as pollinators, we would be in trouble, no doubt about it, right? But pandas, I mean, sure, they're amazing, they're beautiful, they're fantastic to look at. I mean, who doesn't love a panda cub, okay? But should we be deflecting our conservation money somewhere else, right? I'm not saying we should or we shouldn't, I'm just laying out there a difficult question which conservationists have to grapple with. I mean, undoubtedly, there are aesthetic reasons to save this forest, right? This is one of my favorite spots in the world. This is the Monteverdi Cloud Forest. Incredibly, I mean, just an amazing place, right? The bird life, the bugs, the different species of trees, okay? I don't think anyone would argue, or maybe you would, right? That there's no real aesthetic reason to save this forest. You may look at this and go, nah, you know, it's okay. I mean, no big deal, right? Other people would look at this and say it's just absolutely extraordinary and that we need to save this, this forest, right? Because of its beauty. There are probably aesthetic reasons to save this tiger, right? Amazing creature, spectacular creature. But saving species just because they're beautiful doesn't really cut it, right? I mean, what happens if you're ugly? <coughs> Sorry, you're out. Okay, we're not going to be spending any money on your conservation because you're not deemed to be worthy of conservation dollars because you're not aesthetically pleasing, right? Again, it's a difficult question, right? We cannot, I would argue that we cannot argue for the conservation of species just based on beauty. And of course, beauty is in the eye of, of the beholder, right? In terms of, of species. There are pragmatic reasons to save this plant. For example, this is the rosy periwinkle. Right? It's a plant that is used to generate anti-cancer drugs. Very important species and it is protected. Okay? 
So yeah, we should probably save the rosy periwinkle because it's useful to us as humans, right? But what happens to the things that don't make useful things? The humans, again, bam, hit the button, you're out, right? We can't bioprospect and use you as a cancer drug, so we shouldn't be spending conservation dollars on you, right? It's difficult and it's tricky, okay? There's no question as I've, as I've made a comment for that pollinators are absolutely critical in the functioning of ecosystems. And so in looking at conservation and whether we can save the world species and whether we can afford to save the world species, some have argued that we need to look at this from an ecosystem service perspective, right? So Vin made the comment of a species being a keystone species, species that are absolutely foundational to ecosystem functioning, okay? So bees, bumblebees, and all sorts of pollinators do it free of charge, right? You and I don't get a, a bill at the end of the month, like a, like a utility bill, right? Here's how much we owe the pollinating community for doing all their hard work. They do this free of charge, okay? So we need to think about that in terms of, of conservation and what species we should be putting uh, our conservation dollars in. And I just wanted to tie this back into some of those things that we talked about right at the outset, right? I look at this landscape. This is my kind of landscape, an African savanna, some scrubby bush, some incredible elephants in, in the foreground. How much money is that landscape worth? Well, to the local community, it's incredibly important because it creates jobs, ecotourism, preserving the habitat that will preserve the species. It's, it's, it's not easy. And I'm going to come back and, and tie that in at the end, right, about about how we should be spending our conservation dollars. So Norman Myers in the hotspot concept says we should be spending our money where it matters, right? Where things are irreplaceable and where things have been incredibly impacted by humans. And we should probably just let the rest go. I don't know how that sits with you. You know, that doesn't sit real well with me, right? So who is who are we to say, you know what, this landscape, we're just going to walk away from. Okay, and put our money elsewhere. Okay, so Sandy makes a comment looking at the color green is associated with peace, safety, harmony, flowers have an effect on our happiness. I couldn't agree more, right? And, and this notion of getting out into nature, and if you think back to John Muir's, you know, moral and aesthetic nature preservation ethic, right? I've, I've made this comment before. Nothing, and this is just my personal opinion, right? Nothing fills my gas tank more and sitting at a sunrise or a sunset, looking out at a view like this, the African sun goes down, you hear the bugs and the birds, you hear the roar of a lion, you look at a aardvark running through the, the bush. I mean, it's just, it is spiritually uplifting, right? Um, and so, yeah, how, how do we put a price on that? That's, that's, that's very hard. So that's an interesting comment, for sure. Okay, so I'm, I just wanted to, plant that seed because we're going to come back and talk about that as well. So what threatens biodiversity, right? Well, clearly extinction is the key threat to biodiversity. It's very important, of course, to appreciate that extinction is a natural process, right? Humans are not the only species that cause extinctions, right? We have this natural rate of extinction. So just like there's natural changes in climate, uh, species extinction is a, is a natural process. Evolution, adaptation of species, um, and then species go extinct, punctuated by these periods of what we call mass extinction, right? So on the right-hand side, what you're looking at is an image of the seafloor with the Yucatan Peninsula. That's where scientists are now, you know, pretty certain that the, the giant meteorite that, that struck Earth and changed the climate for a long period of time um, accelerated what was an already ongoing process of extinction of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago, right? So extinction is a, is a natural process. The challenge is that humans have come along and accelerated that, okay? And I don't think there's any question about that. So just as climate changes naturally, humans have come along through their use of resources and their fragmentation, fragmentation of the landscape um, and their appropriation of natural forests and, and ecosystems for things like agriculture. So we don't know, to be honest with you, what the exact rate of natural extinction is. I'm not going to ask you this in the blue box here, but scientists have estimated that we should expect two mammals to go extinct 
per 10,000 species per 100 years. What does that mean? Well, that's hard to get one's head around, right? What it means, the take home from this quite simply, everybody, is that natural extinction is a slow process, right? We can look at the fossil record, we can calculate, or we sh I should say, we can estimate what the natural rates of extinction should be, and it is slow. Right? We, we do think, uh, and I would agree with this, that human beings are accelerating that, you know, is it a hundred times? Is it a thousand times? Is it 10,000 times? It depends. I think it depends on where you are. But humans undoubtedly are accelerating the extinction process. So we talk about that we are now firmly in what we call the sixth mass extinction, right? The sixth extinction period, unlike the, the dinosaurs, this is driven by human activity. Okay, for things that we have already talked about. All right, a couple of other terms that I want you to be familiar with, and that's the terms threatened and endangered, um, and listing a species on the endangered species list. So this is a really important bit of legislation that came out in the 1970s. So you may have heard of the Endangered Species Act uh, and the listing of a species on that act, right? Um, a species is threatened if the population is low, but it's large enough that extinction is not imminent in the next generation or two, okay? In endangered species, it's much more serious, right? The numbers are so low that extinction is imminent in a generation or two. There's no exact timeline to that. So those are two terms that I'd like you just to be familiar with. Um, the Endangered Species Act, as I said, is, a, is an incredibly important um, bit of legislation in the US. And incidentally, anybody can put forward a species to be listed on the endangered species list, right? Anybody in the general public can go to the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, that manages and oversees the list uh, and uh, say, you know what, I think the species deserves to be put on the endangered species list. Now you've got to have good reason to it. You can't just come out of thin air and say, you know, I think the grackle should be put on the endangered species list. Well, that's not going to happen, right? We know that that's not even remotely threatened or endangered. So you've got to have a scientific basis to go forward to the US Fish and Wildlife Service and suggest that a species get put on, it gets put on the list. Um, it then goes through review, goes through public review, and if the science says that indeed the numbers are low, that extinction is, is possible or probable, then a species will get onto the endangered species list. There are something like 1,300 species here in the US currently on the list. Uh, it's a big deal, right? It's a big deal if a species gets onto the endangered species list. You can't deforest, you can't build anything. Uh, development essentially uh, is stopped. So that's what that's the US situation. Internationally, uh, I've um, referred to this in, the, uh, in one of the very early lectures. Internationally, that list is managed by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of, of Nature, right? It's a really great website. Uh, we don't have time to go into this in any huge amount of detail, but the IUCN um, through, the, uh, U, through the United Nations um, maintains this list, right? It's called the Red List. Uh, and it's a list of threatened species uh, around the world. It's certainly the most comprehensive list. There are currently, I think it's now through about 120,000 species have been assessed worldwide as to their status. Remember, we have about 1.9 million, right? So this list only addresses a small percentage, um, less than 10% of all the world's species have been properly assessed. They've been identified, but how have they been assessed scientifically? And you can see along the bottom here is a scale, right? Where there are species of least concern or near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered. It's a bit more comprehensive than just listing a species as being threatened or endangered, right? Uh, then there is extinct in the wild and then there is extinct period. So there's quite a, quite a more complicated spectrum here of the status of our species. And I've just put up some percentages. These are percentages, again, that I'm not concerned that you remember, but it's just to give you a sense. Let's look at amphibians. I made this point early on in the course, right? 40% of all the amphibians that have been assessed have been determined to be threatened or endangered 
uh, in some way, right? Mammals, 25%. Um, it's an extraordinary accounting of human impact on species and the environment. Does that make sense? Anybody got any, any questions on the IUCN? They have a big conference coming up in France in September uh, and where they relook at species that should or should not be uh, put onto the, to, onto the list. Okay, I'm going to just, uh, whoops, I should have uh, put that picture up right at the end. Um, a species that is threatened or endangered often shares a number of common traits, right? So let me, let me explain or just articulate what these traits are. It doesn't have to be every one, right? But these are common traits to species that end up being threatened or endangered. One is, these are often species that operate in a very small, localized, specialized area, right? They have a small, localized range, okay? Um, that's very common for species if they are unique to a particular ecosystem. Any kind of impact or fragmentation on that ecosystem would be problematic, right? Or it could be a species that has an extensive range, but has been significantly modified by humans. So the California condor is an example. The California condor has a very wide range, um, but California has a lot of people and it's been modified by humans through agriculture and urbanization and so on, right? Or a species can be an island dweller, right? So you've done this in lab with the Island Biogeography Lab. So species that migrate to an island um, are invariably quite vulnerable because it's hard to get there, right? They evolve in isolation. Uh, they're very sensitive to invasive species, to exotic species, diseases, and so on, right? They don't have the ability to just suddenly migrate away from that particular island. So again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that all island dwellers are threatened and endangered. It's just a common trait, okay? Species that have low reproductive success, right? Um, or species that have a low reproductive strategy. So for example, rhinos, which are one of my species that I'm interested in, uh, the gestation period for a rhino is about 16 months. And then the mom looks after the calf for about another year and a half to two years, right? So mom rhinos are not popping out six babies at a time, okay? It's about a two to three year period before the female rhino can have another, another calf. And then uh, another common trait is they could be a species that are large and easily hunted. Um, this is, let me stop here and, and talk a little bit about, about hunting here because this is a really interesting and controversial and can be quite an emotional topic for, for many people. Um, and so let me just give you my two cents worth here uh, on hunting. Um, I know this is a very personal topic, and it's and it's it's often, uh, if I'm really honest with everybody here, it's often very difficult to find a place to talk about hunting as part of a conservation model, right? So let me give me just a few minutes here to to give you my two cents worth, and then and then I'd be happy to entertain questions or comments from you. Um, so I work in South Africa and Southern Africa, as some of you know, uh, on a rhino conservation project and we work in game reserves that are not hunting reserves they are ecotourism reserves you bring tourists in for a wonderful safari experience and they're photographic reserves right um, we do have reserves that are nearby to our reserves that are hunting reserves and to many people they they find that disgusting right how can how can you have a conservation where you're talking about hunting and conservation in the same sentence well there's a very very a uh, harsh reality to conservation in Southern Africa, right? I can't speak for any other countries. And some of you may be uh, much more um, educated than I am about, about hunting and conservation elsewhere. But there's a harsh reality to conservation in Southern Africa and maybe most of Africa, right? And that is this, that if you were to ban legal hunting, okay? In many parts of Africa, those animals would die, right? The animals that are on game reserves that are part of the conservation, they would die. And it's a really harsh 
reality. But the reality is, and I know personally, I have a friend who owns a hunting lodge. He has the most sophisticated conservation model that I'm aware of. That lodge houses antelope and rhinos and giraffe. Those aren't the animals that are being hunted. Okay, the animals that are being hunted are the plains game like the eland and the, and the antelope and, the, and the, the wildebeest and the buffalo, right? But the money that comes in from hunting, if it's done legally and ethically, and I know there are many people that are gonna have a problem with ethical hunting. Many people may think that doesn't exist. But if it's done well, that money that is put back into conservation and local communities is enormous and an incredibly important part of the conservation model, right? Now, if you want to see what bad hunting looks like, watch a movie called Blood Lions, right? Where lion cubs are taken away from their moms and at a very young age, they're raised in cages and wealthy people are brought in to shoot them on a half an acre and they take their trophy home. That's not what I'm talking about, right? That's not hunting, that's free range murder, right? Um, so let me stop there and open up the conversation because I'm fascinated about people's views on this. I know, for example, I have friends, you know, hunting is big here in Texas, right? And if it wasn't for hunting, many people would argue that we wouldn't have white-tailed deer here. And, and that's an argument that I absolutely believe in and, and buy. So what are your thoughts and comments on, on those traits or, uh, or what I've said so far? It's a pretty difficult topic to talk about, right? Stunned silence. I'm not a hunter, okay? I don't, I, I, it's not something that interests me. Uh, but again, I know many people who are. And in South Africa, for example, Namibia, Botswana, countries that I'm aware of, uh, it's done legally. It's based in many, many organizations. It's based on science, right? So older individual males that, that may become aggressive, that are going to die, uh, they sell those permits for hunting, and if it's done properly, and I can speak for some of my friends who are involved in the business, the money that comes in is enormous, okay? And that supports local jobs. Uh, one of my friends has built a school uh, out of the revenue for that. So it's complicated, I guess, is what it comes down to. But let me see, let me see what you say. Any thoughts or comments on that? So I have a question. To, so yeah. why does the extensive range for um, not like also encompass like island dwellers as well? Because that is, you know, with an island mass versus like a, a conservation, I mean, what would be the difference? Yeah, that, that, so it's a good point, Gavin. They overlap, right? They certainly overlap. These are just, I've tried to break them out individually, but there is there is clearly over you know, overlapping here. You can have island dwellers that have ranges that have, you know, if you think about Borneo, right? Borneo is the third largest uh, island in the world. So that's a that's a region that is 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 under threat because of bullet points number two and three, right? Many of the species there in those Bor Borneo forests have an extensive range, but they've been heavily modified through deforestation and oil palm plantation. And they also happen to be island island dwellers, if that makes sense. So I take your point. There is overlap. Yeah, there's a question from Charity. What about the hunting places that don't do it properly? Yeah, enormously problematic, right? They're in it for the money, okay? Because it costs a lot of money uh, to travel overseas, the equipment's expensive, the lodges charge a lot of money, the permits. Uh, so what about those places? Yeah, those are the places that are, uh, that should be exposed and, and should be banned, right? But, but a lot of it's done kind of under the, guise of being ethical hunting and, and almost no money goes back into conservation, right? Great question. Any other thoughts or comments? I was so, just going to say, yeah, uh, yeah, so I actually used to kind of run the environmental club at, at TCU like two years ago when I was a sophomore. And this was something that we kind of talked about a lot, like where is the ethical line between, you know, maybe helping communities and like getting jobs and things like that for these areas? Because ultimately, like this, like trophy hunting will always happen since there's such a demand for it. Mm -hmm. And I still like I still can't think of what the right answer would be because it's so devastating. And yet it still provides like money for families or like schools being built. And it's right. like, 
there are ways that we can try and make it slightly positive, I guess, even though ultimately like it's the death of an animal. Um, but I feel like as I've thought about it more, like it makes sense to at least, and I'm like happy that it's happening more ethically and that Mm. there's ways to kind of take this horribleness and, you know, create a positive out of it. But, uh, you know, you just wish it wouldn't happen, but I don't know what the alternative would be to this like experience that so many people have the money to seek out. Yeah. So that's, that's beautifully put, right? I don't think I could add anything to that because that's <laughs> very well articulated because, you know, I, I also feel that, uh, you know, that uh, factor. Um, mm-hmm. Courtney writes here, life loses value when death benefits you. Yeah, there, there's absolutely that approach. Look, there's this, you know, there's this, there's this bell-shaped curve, right, to me where at the one end of the spectrum, and I don't know how many people fit under that one end of the spectrum, you're never gonna convince someone that that hunting is conservation. Never, ever, ever, ever. It's gonna be ban trophy hunting, ban hunting, period. There's the other end of the spectrum where all people are interested is the length of the trophy, right? I know people like that. That's all they're interested in. They wanna sit behind the animal on Instagram, look at this giraffe that I just killed, right? That's to me, I go, ugh. Are you kidding? Then there's this very complicated space in the middle, Lindsay. Um, and I don't know where you are, but I find myself in that in that complicated space, right? And is so is there a difference between hunting a lion and hunting an impala? To some there is, to some there isn't, right? To some, the, the, the comment there, life loses value when death benefits you, I couldn't agree more with, right? And then there's the dot, dot, dot. On the, on the other hand, and then who gets to who gets to decide what is ethical hunting and what what is not ethical hunting? So it's it's really really hard, and there's no doubt. Uh, and again, I can only relay my own personal experience. It's very hard looking at conservation in Southern Africa through a Western lens when you get on the ground there, and you see how science is driving the ecosystems, and you go, okay, now sorry folks, suddenly we have 25 too many elephants in this region and they're trampling crops and they're impacting the environment and, we, and we've got to either move them or we've got to cull them, right? Which is a legal way of controlling animals or do we not do that and do we say, let's sell those concessions and build another school? <laughs> you know, I, it's tough, right? It's really, really tough. And it's especially tough for me when I'm sitting in an African landscape looking at an animal going, yeah, I don't think I could do anything else but photograph this. But that's just that's just me. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I wonder if maybe, like, I don't know, in like 50 years or something, we might see more of a cultural shift, especially, I mean, this is more of a Western standpoint, but there's been a lot of, you know, talk about sustainability and animal rights. And I wonder if that might come into play, you know, maybe 100 years from now when our kids are all looking into this and maybe, you know, we'll see more of a cultural shift of people being like, you know, maybe I don't need to do trophy hunting, even though I have all this money, or or maybe there's a way to uh, almost digitize these experiences with like AI. I don't know. That's a whole nother thing, but finding different ways to fulfill this really strange demand that we're not seeing end anytime soon. Again, nicely articulated. Yeah, I don't know. And I don't, I think that shift is happening. Bless you, Kevin. I think that shift is happening now. Um, and I, I, I see it, right? And I see it among, among your generation. Uh, certainly, I think social media is pushing a huge amount of pressure on people, right? Definitely. I think people are, I think people are getting tired of, of seeing these, these images. And so, um, so there's, there's that aspect. Uh, and I think there's, and I think there's another way to approach it. Uh, I, I, I certainly don't think it should be called trophy hunting. And 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 again, just to be fully transparent with you, one of my good friends is very high up in in a um, uh, in a hunting organization, right? And he's like, we do hunts where you may not actually come back with a trophy. We don't, it's, you're you're on foot. Uh, it's for a week. You get to take part in the conservation procedures. You actually get to take part in doing a rhino procedure or, you know, 
you get to spend a morning at one of the local schools and you understand how the money flows. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you get, uh, and, and he's involved not in Lions or anything like that, it's purely planes game. And then if you get, uh, if you get your Buffalo or your uh, Eland, uh, then that is packaged, all the meat is processed, all that meat goes back to local communities, it becomes bush meat, uh, and you have the option of bringing back the horns or not. Does that make sense? It's, it's a, again, to some people, that's, that's not going to work. To others, that, uh, is that a kinder, gentler face to, to the industry, into the industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other thoughts? No, well put. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, it's tough. Anyway, let's move on. Good, thank you. Uh, I'm always aware that this is a this is a tricky topic, right? And so we need to be able to to talk about it. Uh, uh, I think uh, openly. So for me, uh, I'm I'm not anti-hunting if it's done well. And I know that is a very controversial statement to to some because I've seen it done well. And yes, to me there is a difference uh, to shooting um, an, an animal that is endangered versus one that is not. Um, and I know that, and I acknowledge that's also a controversial statement but again that's that's just my experience uh of of context question from sydney are hunters ever background checked at these locations do it? okay so that's a really great question are, are there background checks or is anyone allowed to come in um <laughs> it depends on the outfit of sydney um uh, there's no regulation of so there's no like you know these are the hunting outfits that that we think are the are the the best or the most ethical um but we know that that people come in under the guise of being hunters uh, and they're not, right? They're just there to collect as many trophies as they can. Um, yeah, so it's a good question. So this is, this is the world that we live on, right? We, we live on a fragmented world, a landscape of islands. Some of those islands are big, not, not physical islands, but islands of biodiversity, right? Some of those are protected nature reserves and parks. Some of them are small, and some of them are connected, right, by these very important corridors that you see here uh, of biodiversity. So I just wanted to, we, we won't get time because I, I didn't want to cut short that discussion. That was really interesting. Um, we won't get time to talk about rhinos today. I'm gonna, if we have time, I'll build that in at the end. Um, but we do live on a landscape of islands. And so there's a, a very important area of work and research that's done on, remember when we talked about forests, the, one of the two things that I think we need to do is preserve as much forest as we can intact. The same goes for, for res preservations, right? National parks and game reserves and so on. Um, so where I work in South Africa uh, on the Rhino Conservation Program, we're working with 10 individual game reserves, physically isolated, physically separated, but we're trying to buy land to connect those reserves, right? So, the, the, so we're working on a model of connected conservation. And these are, these are called biological corridors, corridors along which species can migrate. Now, these corridors, if I just go back one, these corridors may just be like this green corridor you see on the right that bird species and other species can migrate along. Obviously, it's tricky if you're dealing with lions and leopards and hyenas. You have to have those fenced off somehow. Uh, but this idea of connected conservation which is enormously problematic given the pressures that we've talked about in this course a lot with uh, food and agriculture and people and so on. So here's just an example of one of the more important biological corridors in the world. This is the Mesoamerican biological corridor. So anything in green here, uh, as you see stretching from Panama down south up through Nicaragua uh, and onwards up through to uh, Mexico, um, anything in green is an already existing protected area, right? And of course, this whole um, tongue of land, this isthmus that connects North America from South America, this physical geographic corridor, was once uh, a bridge for species to migrate north and south, right? Then we have countries, now we have agriculture and so on. It's become very fragmented. Anything in red is a biological corridor trying to connect these national parks and these, and these state parks, sort of weaving their way around uh, private lands and agriculture and, and, and so on. So that's one of the challenges that we face when it comes to conservation is, is as I said before, you know, we, we used to build fences to keep the animals out in the wild. And now we've got so many of us, we now build fences to keep them in 
in these green areas? How do we begin to open those green areas up uh, and, and connect them to uh, through conservation? So thoughts and comments on that. I was hoping to get to talk about these little munchkins. Um, so I'm going to stop there uh, and I'm going to reevaluate the schedule. My guess is I want to get onto soils and water and I think I'll have time at the end for about 30 minutes just to talk about what we're doing in, uh, in South Africa when it comes to rhino conservation. Questions, thoughts, any comments, everybody? Otherwise, we'll end four minutes early today. All right. Well, thank you for your, uh, your questions and your comments. Uh, have a good day. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good everyone. Uh, I have a question about our, our exam. Um, so, sorry, uh, give me one sec. Give me one sec, Vin. I just need to get the door here. Okay, question. Sorry, who was that? Oh, that was me. Gavin. Yes. Uh, so how far back are we looking for um, exam material for the upcoming one? Like what date and what lecture? <laughs> uh, upcoming exam is everything beyond the greenhouse effect. So chapter six, climate change, starting from carbon and temperature and, and the politics of climate change, I believe. Okay. All right. Thank you. You bet.